love is the electron in every atom. Those are God's eyes and ears. It creates the omniscience, which makes God visible everywhere in the universe. Those are his eyes and ears, the electron in every atom. And it is pure love that created them, so they radiate pure love, if you will accept it. Uh, it's very uh, noted in all his biographies, his last biography. Uh, there's photographs of me. There's a whole chapter on my experiences with Swami, where he saved my life uh, when a car went over a hill and I was asleep, and he came to put a force field around me and saved my life. I also died once, two years later, in a hotel room in Denver, Colorado. Swallowed my tongue. I had an epileptic fit. And uh, my, out of my crown chakra, this is where the spirit comes out, I was on the ceiling watching, dead, looking at my dead corpse. This is all well documented, by the way, in all the Swami biographies, uh, which I reluctantly tell, because you cannot believe these things unless you've experienced them. Otherwise, it's just fairy tales. Just like metaphysics. I've been brought along in lots of metaphysical things. I can do yogic things that Swami has taught me, but I can't explain them to you. But everybody's interested in the miracles. Everybody's interested in all that crazy stuff. And it's meaningless. It means nothing. It gives you a false sense of understanding what an enlightened being is all about. You are already enlightened beings, Swami's teachings, which very few people read. They're all here that came here for years for the show. I've been here 40 years. And I've watched them come to the prestige, the show, the darshan, give me a ring, give me an interview, give me this, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. You know, no one was giving to him. The only thing he wanted, his food, love, as you call it, love. And love is emerging between two people. You know, he says, two or more are gathered in my name, and I am there. Because satsang, or speaking of the higher nature, which you already are a realized being, and so am I, it's just that you don't know it. Swami talked about it many times. You know, his teachings are obvious, but to dote and to care about miracles and things like that is a complete distraction. It's a delusion. It's not important. And yet that's what everyone wants to believe. Not his teachings. They want to believe in the miracles. Can I have a ring? Can I have an interview? Will you look at me? You know, will you come close to me? He is swinging in everyone's heart in a jula every moment that you breathe. Whether you know this or not, the Vedas say that you are born with a certain number of breaths. And the Vedas tell you that the breath itself is a mantra. So hum, so hum, so hum. So as you're breathing in and out, you're actually living and breathing a mantra of love. It's uh, very difficult times right now. People are very frightened, much anger, much fear in the world. All the people who are weak, the weak ones of us are suffering more than ever before. People are desperately looking for an answer, and they're looking outside. There's nothing outside. That's Maya. Everything is on the inward path, not the outward path. Swami is a reflection of myself, period. He taught me that himself. I, I was lucky to be very, very close to his physical form. I was very, very lucky to speak with him many times because he had projects he wanted, he chose me to do through the grace, his grace. But Swami was an enlightened being, on the external enlightened being. This country, many other countries, have all of these masters have come since the beginning of time. You know, so Swami happens to be the one for this particular age between probably 1950 and his recent death. Before that, there was Vivekananda, Yogananda, Ramakrishna, who died in 1865, a whole string of these masters, Jesus Christ, Mohammed. These are all messengers of the same exact human values, how to live, what to do. There's religion, 
and there's spirituality. Religion is something that is created by man and his greed for knowledge and power. You all know this from the Russian Orthodox Church, yes. who's in cahoots with the government like this. But that's nothing new. It was the same with the Catholics. It was the same with the Protestants. It's the same with everybody. That's religion. That's politics. That's nonsense. Spirituality is one's personal journey to the heart, to the truth. And we're all on that journey, like it or not, some more evolved than others, but we're all on that journey to the same place. I love Russia, by the way. I love you Russian folks. <laughs> Been there many times, before and after. Y'all are great. Look, it doesn't make any difference if you follow Allah, if you follow Jesus, if you follow, you know, the teachings of Buddha, the teachings of all of these great religions, the Zoroastrians who are now gone, the great Prussians who had Zoroastra as their, their mentor, their man that brought the word down. But if you read every one of those religions, which all are cultural phenomenon that occurred at a certain time in history, and no one followed these men when they were alive. Swami's the first because of modern technology of communication and so forth to have so many people know about him. You know, but the rest of these guys had Rama, supposedly the first avatar, a holy man on the planet that lived 10,000 years ago. There were 11 rishis who knew who he was. Krishna said he only had a few devotees. He had them on one hand. You know, Jesus had 12 disciples. After they left, the power of their words and their energy created all, a whole new religion and a real, not religion, but a whole new hope for mankind and spirituality. But all of those religions, if you read them, teach exactly the same things. The words of the masters are always the same. Love, peace, truth, nonviolence. This is what it's all about. Satya. Prima. This is the taught in every single religion. It doesn't make any difference what religion you follow. Sri Sai Baba didn't come here to start a new religion or even gain devotees. They, had, they came because they heard about him. They came because of the prestige. They came to see the freak show. Very few people read his words, and I guarantee you 90% of his devotees don't really understand who he was. And this is the reason why. Swami himself even said, I can count all my devotees on one hand. What does that mean? Because only a realized being can recognize another realized being. We didn't know that he was a reflection of ourselves. We thought he was outside. Duality is what he preached against his whole career. Duality. And at this darshan every day, this show that was put on, the second that he walked in, people practiced duality, delusion, duality. God's over there, and I'm over here. Wrong. God is here in your heart, swinging in a little swing. He's available to you at any time. But everyone wanted to practice duality. They wanted to believe that there was something higher than themselves. Absolutely impossible. God made everyone in His image. And that's the light body, not the physical body. The, I died. I left out of my crown chakra a dead body sitting on a floor in Denver, Colorado in the mid-70s. And I'm up on the ceiling looking down at my dead body. And I started laughing. I was in the form of electricity is the only way I can describe it. I knew who I was. But I'm looking down at my dead body. I start laughing. I said, what's that? What in the hell is that? I thought I was that, but I'm this. And this is immortal. This is forever version. So what's that? What an illusion I have been going through thinking that I was not a divine being or there was something else going on. This is Maya. This is the delusion of the world. This is the trap that everybody is in right now. 
because this is the Kali Yuga. This is supposed to be their ages, various ages, as you may know from the Vedas. And you can read the Old Testament, you can read whatever you want to, and they all talk about the different ages and a big change coming, and eventually there's going to be a reckoning and the world will change and go back to the way it was, peace, love, whatever. We're destroying everything, each other, the planet, so forth and so on. But the fact remains is that, you know, this is life is an opportunity. Everybody thinks they're a victim. Oh my God, this happened to me, that happened to me, this happened to me, I'm a victim, I'm a victim, I'm a victim. I've been victimized, oh, my money's been taken away, my wife's been taken away, I'm sick. Uh, this man cheated me, uh, this is horrible. I, this, this, this. Everybody thinks they're a victim. That is the most selfish thought you can have. Because the first law of physics is for every action, there's an equal reaction. Okay, they call that karma. Whatever you put out, you're going to get back. Okay? But the point being is, uh, you're not a victim. You know, you're not a victim. Just like the first law of physics, for every action, there's an equal reaction. You are making your future now by what you're doing. The same thing with metaphysics as with physics. Whatever you put out, you're going to get back. This lifetime, next lifetime, you're not a victim. Mm -hmm. Only the hand that writes the script of your life, you, can erase it. No one else. So you, should, you come to this planet, you come for a short time, it's a blink, blink in the totality of all the possible lifetimes you've been here before. And everybody takes themselves so seriously that they forget to love each other. What did the great Jesus say, which Muhammad said, which all of them said, love others as you would love yourself. Very few people know how to do that. Because this thing, this mind, this ego, has a limited shelf life. It has a limited time. It knows it's here for 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, 70 years, and it wants control of you. It doesn't want you to take the spiritual path. You're constantly thinking, 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 no, yes, impossible, can't believe it, so forth and so on. That makes it a very, very happy ego. And it has its best friends, the five senses. Those are the five delusions that are in your life. For instance, the first thing you do when you wake up, you open your eyes, you see, you smell, you taste, you touch. So you think you are the mind and you are the body. Totally against everything that all the masters have spoken of. Because you're not the mind and you're not the body. You're a divine being. You're simply paying your dues. You can either evolute and grow higher and erase the script and do good, or you can devolute and go backwards and you will pay especially if you harm other people in any way. Thinking is the most powerful thing that you can do. That was the second law of physics. Energy never dies. That's the second law of physics, proven. Never dies, it goes somewhere else. So, this is an electrical machine. We all know it works on electricity. The mind works on electrical impulses. This is how the heart beats, correct? So. The point being is that, where does this energy go? Okay, think of all of the good energy from the beginning of time. Okay, compassion, mercy, love, forgiveness, worship of the higher nature. All of that energy doesn't dissipate into nowhere. It goes into a nearby dimension. Fortunately, whether you want to believe it or not, Swami graced me to show me that dimension. And it's beautiful. But also, think of all the negative thoughts that man has had since the beginning of time. Lust, anger, hatred, violence, jealousy. Where does that energy go? It goes to another nearby dimension, another plane. Okay, it's dangerous stuff. And it feeds on man's energy. This is why you pray, you meditate, you be good to people, you do, you're compassionate, you have mercy, you have all these things going, you know, and you feel, you feel it coming back. 
If I'm kind to you, sincerely kind, you will feel it and you will be happy. And that makes me happy. Okay? But if you go out and you hate somebody or this or that, these negative forces will come down and attach themselves to you. It's like a tuning fork. You get into hatred, 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 hatred. And all of a sudden, a little filament comes from this different dimension where all the negative archetypes are, all this negative energy is, and it'll attach to you. And it'll start feeding off of you because that's its food. Its food is hatred. So what it does, it keeps you angry as long as it can. It keeps you in hatred as long as you can because that's its food. That's how it exists. So you're no longer even in control of yourself. You have to be very careful, Swami said many times, as all the masters have. You know, watch your thoughts. Thinking is the most powerful thing you can do on this planet. Because this just isn't regular energy. This is what the Hindus call prana energy. And it's a very lonely job. Because nobody knows who I am. I'm a myth. I'm an image. Just like uh, today, it's so sad. Everyone is judged by their checkbook, how much money they have. Even if they're evil, rotten, killers, everything, and they've made their money, and there's so, people are so obsessed with thinking that money gives them some sort of peace, that these evil men become heroes, even a good man. You know, people creating a myth was part of my job for Sai Baba. So I could go out and spread... I don't care how many speeches I give, and I've only given four at his request. I'm looking for one man, just one that I can change. And if the myth is important, if the myth breaks through, if the myth allows him to open up and listen, I'll take the myth. But guess what? Nobody knows who I am. I'm an enigma. Sai Baba was an enigma. No one knows who he was either. Not that I'm Sai Baba. He's inside of me. He was a realized being. But the point is, being a myth is a lonely, lonely place to be. Because people would rather believe in the image than the person. And Swami put me in this position when I was very young. I made my first million dollars when I was 17, 18 years old. I started businesses that made me famous. So then the myth began. And then he brings me here and I build this hospital for him. More myth. No one knows who I am. They don't. They just know the myth. I'm a warrior. I'm a different type of man than you can imagine. I'm no myth when it comes down to what I will do for what I believe, which he gave me, and he trusted me to forgive everybody. The true path, this is very, very important, the true path to love, real love, not human love. Human love is this grasping, holding, contracting, selfish nonsense. Divine love, the divine of the universe, is this ever-expanding, inclusive, 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 inclusive phenomenon. The true path to love, real love, is first, the most difficult, forgiveness of yourself. You must learn to forgive yourself for being human and having so many frailties. Life was not meant to be easy. You wrote this book, and now you've got to read it. And the other, after you learn to forgive yourself, is to forgive others. If you learn to forgive yourself and forgive others, you are on the path of true love. Sirens. He brought me here in 2006, and he said, after many years of coming five, six times a year, helping him with the hospital, being near him, sitting, you know, you don't see many white people sitting up there on the veranda. <laughs> and you know what he told me when he put me up there? He said, Tigret, you are my bait for evil. I said, what do you mean, Swami? And then I, he said, what do you think I mean? And then I understood, because he's very much like a Zen master. You come here, and you come here because you want to evolute and you want to change. It's an opportunity. And the only way he can change you, a master can change you, is bring out of you that which needs to be changed. 
So if you're full of anger or lust or hatred or whatever it is, jealousy, all of this will come out here because you can face it, you can see it, and He will show you how to change. That's what He did more than anything else. That's the real reality of Sai Baba. He changed you. He changed me. And I would fall off the path and He'd pick me up and put me back on and He'd change me again. <laughs> I'm the most imperfect of all of His devotees. Swami brought me here in 2006. He said, you stay here with me for the rest of your life. Okay? And over that period of time, He gave me the, these plans to do a sacred city to serve mankind that will come soon, within 20 years. He asked me to give this information to the Sai family. The Sai family is not a bunch of Sai devotees, it's the entire planet. Yes. Those, or if it's Jesus, they're all the same. So I have prepared that. There is a website called www.mysticinoftheseventhray.org and you can go on and see the first installment. came out two weeks ago. It took me seven months to do. Boy, was that crazy. Uh, but it's out there. And it's interesting because Swami said to me, because this is a long-term project. It's going to take 20 years to build. Right now we're looking for sponsors and supporters to help us with Professor Keith Critchlow, who's the famous geometrist, sacred geometrist from the Prince of Wales School in London. Mm -hmm. God manifests himself in three ways in this dimension. Sound, light, and geometry. That's how he manifests himself. And there's a key that Dr. Critchlow opened up, which he found in all the ancient, ancient structures all over the world, in all the religions, whether it's Chartres Cathedral, whether it's mosques here and there, whether it's, you know, all these different things. He found a common thread of geometry which creates the perfect vibration. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that must be done, because this is not my field, you know, I, 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 I'm a businessman, you know, I'm a, I'm a builder of rock and roll houses, you know, can you imagine? Whoa. I love it, all of these people, uh, you know, used to put me down saying, oh, it's terrible, you sell meat, you sell alcohol, you do all this stuff, blah, 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 blah. And Swami encouraged me to do it, and he, he, he told me, he said, look, God works 24 hours a day, and he has a lot more work to do at 12 midnight than he does at 12 noon. <laughs> So I was his late night representative. And that's why I love all, serve all, and the way I ran my business was run on the five basic human values. Because materialism and spirituality are intertwined. They're not two separate things. My father came here when we opened the hospital. Yeah? Yes. When we opened the hospital, my father came here. And after the opening that day, which was done by President Prime Minister Rao, of the Super Specialty Hospital, Swami called my father and myself into an interview room. And my father said to Sai Baba, he was not a devotee, he just came because he was proud that I had opened this hospital, just like a good father. And he said, Sai Baba, thank you so much for taking such good care of my son. Mm. And very firmly, Sai Baba said, not your son, my son. So, if she feels close to Sai Baba, he is the Sai Baba, mother, yes, father. Yes, okay? Yes. The thing about evolution and about getting close to the truth is you've got to ask for it. God's first law is he will not interfere with man's free will. He will not make you do this and tell you to do this and do all this stuff. You can do anything you want. Be bad, be good, be this, be that. It's your own manufacturer. But if you want him to come into your life and help you, you have to call him. <laughs> Why do you think people pray to Jesus? Why well, am not going to give you a million dollars and do all these other silly <laughs> things. But he can make you learn more. He can make the pain easier. Just, uh, one of Sai Baba's expressions was, uh, you take one step towards me, I take a hundred towards you. <laughs> you shed one tear for man, I shed a thousand. So you have to ask. You have to ask.
or you will not have this opportunity. I gave this interview because I love my Russian brothers and sisters. I, people ask me every day to do what we're doing now. And I, I say, no, no, no. But when you approach me yesterday and ask me, something in my heart said, tell him yes, because the brothers and sisters need to hear the truth. And I hope that I've spoken the truth properly. Certainly very <laughs> vivaciously at the least. Yes. Mm -hmm. But he said the first job, the first job you have in announcing these things I've given you is to bring people hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things he was very clear about when he gave me these instructions, remember this, Tigret, these are my ideas not your ideas. Because <laughs> he knows my ego is the size of the Ukraine. <laughs>